I'm going to give the floor to Liz Jayan to start with her presentation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm very happy to present the ICON project with, uh, with my French colleagues. So you mentioned Daniel Folia. We have uh, Marina with us as well, and Sumik, who will uh, introduce themselves later on. Uh, but the ICON project is a very new project. Actually, we just uh, submitted, the, we just sent the, the press release yesterday. So I'm going to, uh, to put the link uh, in the chat if you want to have a look. Uh, so it's a, a project which is funded on the UK side by the HRC, uh, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and I'm the UK PI. And we have on the French side, we have uh, two main partners, uh, so LabEx and uh, the University of Paris as well. So it's quite a large project uh, and we are very happy uh, you know uh, very grateful for this funding because we have you know quite uh, ambitious objectives you know we want to apply AI to historical war photographs uh, and we want to make those historical war photographs more accessible more discoverable and more usable, of course. Uh, we are also very aware of the ethical issues uh, associated with artificial intelligence. Uh, and this is, of course, you know, part of the project as well. Um, and I should say that ICANN is actually my third international project. You know, I'm also working with Irish colleagues on the AURA project. Perhaps some of you are familiar with this project uh, and also with US, US colleagues uh, on the Aeolian project. Uh, and all those projects are about artificial intelligence applied to archives. So it's very much, you know, something uh, that I'm doing at the moment. I'm very uh, happy to work with, you know, international partners uh, uh, on those projects. Um, and we are very lucky for the ICON project to have, you know, major cultural institutions who are uh, part, uh, you know, who are working with us, uh, including on the, in the UK, the Imperial War Museum. So, of course, you know, a major player here uh, based in London, uh, National Library of Scotland as well and the Welcome Collection. Uh, on the UK side, um, so that's, you know, the main partners. On the French side, we have so many partners. I'm not going to uh, list them all, but, you know, the, the major partners are the uh, Quai Branly uh, Museum in Paris. Uh, Daniel and his team are organizing a workshop there in June. And, you know, they will say a few words about this workshop because we are very much, you know, looking forward to it. Uh, it's going to be, you know, uh, one of our uh, main major outcomes for, for the project. And of course, we have other outcomes as well. Again, you know, the, the French colleagues are going to tell you more uh, about this. Uh, we have a, a project website already, you know, you will be happy to hear that, and also Twitter accounts. So I should say it's a new project, so we don't have a lot of followers at the moment, but please follow us, you know, if you are able to, you know, we would be very uh, grateful for this. And um, so I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Dan Daniel, uh, who will say a few words about you know, the, the real uh, objectives of the project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Um, so really quick five minutes to, to introduce the project for an overview of the project and, and address some of the questions we we're we starting asking on the on the data sets. Um, the campus is a sort of hub um, to aggregate different funds from different institutions. You've seen the list, the list of institutions involved in the project before that. Um, as of today, Marina will uh, maybe uh, confirm that we have more than 100,000 photographs covering armed conflicts from the 1890s to the, the First World War. So the idea was really to go on the margin of the history of photography, to document early war photography, and to focus specifically on less documented terrains, such as colonial uh, wars in particular. So we're very, very um, in interested in that. The, the focus is on, on a diversity of conflict to de-invisibilize uh, some wars and expeditions that are less known to the public and even to specialists. So uh, for the 1914-1918 uh, funds, what we're going to address uh, intensively are non-European battlefields in particular. So the ACON project aims at applying artificial intelligence tools to a, a huge database of uh, untapped material uh, to, to visualize uh, in, a, in, a, in a more uh, specific way uh, the global conflictuality at the time. 
um, late 19th century, early 20th century. The, the main objective is really an analysis of uh, the Belle Epoque, Edwardian age, visual culture. Um, and we want to apply artificial intelligence tools to these historical margins. And the idea is to apply what I would call a sort of dual use of existing data sets to adapt them to our documentation and using artificial intelligence with and against the grain to try and create metadata at scale. So the idea is to um, classify images automatically, to uh, create, uh, to, to augment our capacity to detect specific objects that are connected to our topic. In, in this case, scene understanding of warfare in particular, and to use these foundations to explore effective visualizations of a very large visual corpus. So the end uh, outcome will be a demo website uh, displaying, exhibiting what we we've been able to do. And one of the key aspects as well is to discuss with the partner institutions how to create a, a, a emerging project, a project that can connect different institutions, stakeholders and specialists uh, into this. Obviously, one big issue for such a, um, a project is the ethical uh, issue, because some of the images we have are showing humiliated uh, people, in particular in colonial situations. So we are going to be very careful about how we apply existing data sets uh, and how we are going to display these images online uh, in, in the uh, demo website. Um, so a few questions, because obviously we're not exactly right in the middle of the question of archives. We are in between historical analysis Work, working with archival specialists and applying AI expertise. Sumik is gonna talk about this uh, after me. Uh, the bias we're gonna talk about, even if Sumik is gonna address algorithmic bias as well, is cultural bias. And how uh, do we define this? There is no ground truth for, from a, a historical and archival perspective. And the project is really about this, about defining uh, polyphonic uh, perspectives on what exactly uh, is uh, ground truth for us. We have uh, we have to take into account the fact that the data sets we have we are going to use are uh, full of inherent cultural biases. Uh, there's a lack of li linguistic diversity, so even applying the data sets to French newspapers and French photographs can be a problem, we want to experiment with uh, face classifiers and gender classification. Here again, we know we're gonna face huge obstacles and we already try applying ImageNet to a set of images. Um, Maina is gonna talk about this. It's hugely anachronistic on many objects from the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, what we want to do is have a hands-on approach to make sure that uh, machine learning application will reflect historical questions and um, to, uh, we will have a preference for supervised and super, semi-supervised uh, few-shot learning strategies to make, make sure we can use human augmentation to avoid some of the main ethical problems here. Uh, the other idea, I mentioned it um, uh, earlier, is the idea of adapting, using existing data sets to transfer them and fine tune them for, for our own uh, work. We are thinking about applying weaponry uh, data sets and fine tune them to um, detect objects uh, in, in a very um, effective way on our data set. Another thing that we'd like to do, and I'm sure it's going to raise questions, um, and that could be used for archival selections, using AI could be very interesting to isolate outliers, cultural outliers, specifically when you think about images a very anomalous images, image when once vectorized can be a very good point of entry into the visual culture. If you think about Kappa's first war photographs, they were absolutely aesthetically completely different from the rest. And in terms of assessing what should be in an archive, regularity is as important as anomalies and artificial intelligence can help identify these anomalies. And I'm gonna ask a few provo provocative questions because we already started thinking about how AI can create new relations to the archive. Uh, my, one of the questions we are asking is, are black boxes such a problem after all? Because then they can create new relations uh, between uh, end users 
and an archival fund. Um, and another thing that I think is important, and we clearly at the center of this, connecting different partners with different control vocabularies, um, semantics, and ontologies, is I think to us, the diversity in the way people deal with archives if, and applying AI to archives is very interesting. It's important, it's culturally relevant. Pure systemic alignment would be a problem to a certain extent. And I would be ready uh, to take questions about this. It's very interesting to see how different institutions are dealing with the, their archives, applying new technologies, because it's, a, again, a way to put bias, all sorts of bias into uh, perspective and to underline them. Um, and one of the last thing we are going to try and explore on the long term is to use artificial intelligence to make layers of selection, uh, creation of control vocabularies and erasures apparent. AI could use quantify uh, this in, in a very relevant way. And I'm gonna stop there and let Sumi talk about the more uh, technical aspects of our work. And Sumik is the leader in applying artificial intelligence solutions to your so, data. Thank you so much for Daniel to explaining everything. So because uh, right now we are we are a very early phase uh, to to our projects and so uh, there are many many obstacles and as well as we have huge challenges so yes uh, so uh, so as we know that uh, we have the huge amount of math amount of data and we can we cannot uh, have uh, to use uh, like the handcuffed features because it will be take time and we have to lose the massive amount of time and as well as we we have uh, the huge amount of data for the for the text for the means like uh, I can say like uh, the historical archive data and the newspaper. So we want to finding out uh, different layout from the semantic uh, informations from the from the text and images from the historical archive. So generally, what we want to do, we are implementing uh, some of this uh, already existing deep learning method. For example, uh, using the Detection Two, uh, using by the layout Farsa. Uh, it is a it is a well known method that uh, is already been exist. So we are also we are getting inspired from them and we are trying to use uh, some of this uh, some of this method uh, the, with uh, with the layout layout process. And as well as probably we can also try to have uh, some of this other method we can also using for uh, for the detection two with the with the pub layout and the layout parsers. So it could be probably can we have uh, helpful for us, but but uh, for the right now we are facing a lot of diversity, and uh, for the, for the images that we have, we have some of these images which is content with the scanning noise of working papers and working and uh, and uh, for example so like uh, some uh, some some of the images are like a uh, like a cropping, and uh, like uh, we are also facing uh, like uh, some of these data has uh, like uh, I can say like uh, uh, less amount of metadata. That uh, that we, we have, so we what we'll do uh, like we have to do some kind of fine tuning for 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 our existing model, and maybe we can do some retraining of of this uh, of this information of this data. So, so for that uh, previously already existed, like uh, I can say, like uh, means uh, for for example, I think uh, the people those who already working in the for the um, AI or artificial intelligence, they already know about the faster RCNN or for example, for the mask uh, RCNN or deep lab, uh, they do the pixel-wise segmentation. So pixel-wise segmentation has already been working very, very well for object detection and the tracking, even for the uh, image document analysis. So uh, as I already explained a little bit about the layout parser, the layout parser is already combined with the, some of these methods. So we are using this thing to using, uh, using this kind of facility uh, yeah, for, for, uh, for detecting some of this object uh, from the uh, archival newspaper. Uh, it could be very helpful for us uh, to, but uh, because we have several challenges uh, because the, there are different layout and some of the layout are very, very compl com complicated and there are several, uh, I can say like the, the lot of tables and other things. So it is it is very, very challenging. So we are working towards these challenges because it is normal that uh, um, like uh, when you do some kind of new things, so we have to face, uh, face a different kind of challenges. And uh, so I believe that uh, it would be overcome very soon uh, and uh, we are working towards it. Second thing is that, uh, like we want to extract more information. So you implemented some, some kind of, I can say the CNN features with the ResNet 152. So, and with the uh, embedded uh, graph embedding. So it's like a, one kind of say, uh, like a contextual graph uh, or like context net. 
So we can extract uh, different context from the research, uh, means uh, from the newspapers. And, uh, see, and we try to finding out the different similarities. So in the left hand side, you can see like, we can uh, we can finding out the different uh, similarity by the knowledge graph. So knowledge graph is a is a is a very very powerful. Uh, I can say like a, a, a graphical tools. Uh, previously, it was used uh, used in the I can say uh, in the in the art. So it uh, it can be useful for us to using similar kind of method for us. For example, for you, if you like the query like colony or um, or like colonization troop. So it can be semantically it can be uh, connected with the other uh, other pictures. So it can be showing the other pictures um, uh, related with the colonization troop. So it could be helpful for us. So we are also working towards uh, these directions, but it is very very early phase. It could be changed in in the um, in 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 the, in future. We can think because the historical data is like we have, uh, I can say, like a lot of domain gaps because the data set are quite versatile and there are like a lot of challenges. For example, like uh, I can say that Daniel already said that uh, most of the historical data is, uh, is I can say this is, is, uh, is a content uh, like the Western language, European language or Latin language or for French language, but it could be problematic for, for example, so like if we are using some of this method for like the Hindi, Chinese or Japanese or the Korean. So well, we are thinking like uh, some of these algorithms could be, we will use it for, for transfer learning or the domain adaptations. It is already been useful for many of these uh, uh, people there, I means people those working in the AI or deep learning, they're also already using. So, uh, and we are also using some of, some of this method. Uh, but, uh, but because we have uh, so many complex diversity, maybe we can also face some of this problem, for example, like catastrophic forgetting, or uh, maybe we can also facing like, I can say like overfitting of this model because due to the large parameters. So you have to see to how to fine tunes and we have to see that how we can balance the weights of, uh, of our parameter to, to, I can say like, uh, to, to balance our model. So, um, so we are like right now it's very very preliminary stage. So we are uh, uh, we are uh, going to uh, the develop the new model, and I hope uh, I think maybe in June and July we have uh, some prototype that maybe it could be useful uh, to to giving to the archival community that we, we are looking for. And I think the Marina will uh, show us and give us more details about the technical difficulty and the the data sets uh, is working for for us. And uh, this data set will be helpful for us uh, because we will implement it, our deep learning method on our data set and, uh, and we're really helpful for the money. Yes, um, so my slide is um, later. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm Marina Giardinetti and I'm a research assistant specialized in creating uh, digital tools and uh, I'm in charge of collecting and modeling uh, the data we use uh, in the ACONS project. Uh, and even if it's look basically easy to automatize, it's let's emerge that we need to step in to make crucial choices in terms of which data we collect, how we preserve it uh, with its metadata and um, its description and origin on how we display it while keeping trace of the choices we made on these, um, on these processes. The first bias appears when we choose the data to collect in large corpora. Uh, a way of selection with the API is to use controlled uh, vocabularies, which identifies the main subjects and uh, or features of document. Uh, for us, a picture or a photo album. Working on specific uh, historical conflicts, their denominations are the first vocabulary we use to find the digitized archives, but the early conflicts are not named in the same manner on every library. For example, the, Bo the Boxer Rebellion is not named the same on Gallica and the Library of Congress. The data are not the same on the way of describing them, identifying them are not, um, um, are at the first level are not the same. Uh, depending on this statement, it's look essential to rethink the semantics chosen to describe the digital materials we have collected in your own database. We must choose a database for alignment and referencing of our data, uh, which matches with, with a less subjective point of view to identify and describe events or troops. Uh, with a database like Wikidata, which appears as a crossroad, as data crossroad between uh, the collection, we avoid the semantic bias. Uh, which could appear at this level. Uh, Wikidata allows to align people, events, or locations with unique identifiers from several denominations. 
then the different corpora will be defined at the same semantic level. But issues uh, remain because how to take colonial troops uh, at a local level into account. Uh, for example, the photo from Gallica uh, is labeled uh, as colonial army. <laughs> Um, untitled as well. Uh, the term used is based on colonial and racial consideration and absolutely not from precise data or analysis. It embraces a large variety of events from an only French point of view. The vocabulary is outdated, particularly in colonial contexts. Moreover, on the pictures, mm -hmm. without any description, uh, artificial intelligence can make links and bypass the, bypass the original metadata. Uh, it's not taking care of the denominations, but only on the visual content. On the other, on the other hand, training it with new semantic will combine visual and textual approaches. Then to decolonize the control vocabulary in describing the pictures of identified troops and people uh, will cause the multiplication of terms referring, referring to armies, parts of armies, uh, local population, troops. Uh, we model uh, our database. This is to say we normalize, uh, standardize the organization of the archives around this semantic. Then we deduce and create relations on the hierarchy between these entities. This categorization effort is made way more complex with the aim uh, of doing the contrary of a major goal to decrystallize the common vocabulary used. Um, and the artificial intelligence tools stay close to the database. This one begins to be the bias of the artificial intelligence multimodal text and images analysis by the choices of semantic and categorizing, um, adding rigid tags. So yes, the second slide. Um, the artificial intelligence has a crucial role uh, in the creation of new vocabulary. Uh, in fact, by its natural tendency to repeat the original annotation, it makes the ones we couldn't see appear before. For example, maybe after having automatically classified some pictures uh, with troops uh, as colonial armies, it will make us very clear that it's not specific enough to distinguish every troop um, as an historian who have done. Uh, in our metadata, we should have kept, kept the original denomination given by the library. If it's different to rightly say, we added another proposition of tagging as a result of artificial intelligence tools. Here occurs another historical issue for archivists where can they position themselves on the reliability of the artificial intelligence results for recreating metadata. And uh, is it reliable? Is it a reliable workflow for historians to add 75, 80% recall weights results to context metadata? Uh, I don't know if I have some time left again or if I must finish. It's up to the team. Sorry? We still have time. It's up to you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I was just to be sure. Um, but it's um, so, however, it's, uh, it doesn't look accessible to completely bypass the original semantic bias. Uh, what we can try is to give access, uh, compare and document the different tries to avoid it. Uh, writing a history of the artificial intelligence processes and biases will enable us to make them appear and not forgetting them in the reading of results. Uh, writing the bias of the history of metadata collected follows the same aim as keeping track of the digitization of an archive. Uh, the object used before digitization is different from the object obtains, obtained, uh, such as uh, the object used before uh, the AI treatments will be different from the one obtained after. As we keep track of the original material object in the digitization process, we should add the metadata from um, AA level. Uh, I will deeply reconnect, it will deeply reconnect the metadata with the archive as well as with the digital object as it's historical and this new digital context. This context must be integrated into the final front end to, uh, to not lose these uh, essential aspects. So I will finish on that. Thank you so much for this great presentation. And so now we open the floor for questions um, from the audience. If you have a question, please uh, feel free to uh, um, 
raise your hand, unmute yourself, and then or tell them in the chat, and they're going to be read so that you can. Um, our panelists, actually, our guest speaker, can address those. Uh, so the floor is open. And so if I may uh, get us started while people are still thinking about the kind of question that they wanted to ask you is uh, when you talk about um, um, historical biases and I saw you at, uh, trying to find ways that kind of uh, talk about, you know what, writing them down, right? So that you can actually document those. So when it comes to AI, uh, uh, applying AI in archival prison and selection, how can archivists actually what other ways or what other means can archivists uh, use to ensure that either they avoid or they uh, present, right, um, on the, 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 the historical biases? Sorry, I didn't get the, the last part. I'm sorry, because there was a glitch. Yeah, so I was wondering, like, how, based on your work and the work that you're doing now, how are you envisioning um, archivists using AI in archival selection, archival appraisal and selection to address issues of uh, historical biases? I think um, what becomes clear from the, um, the starting point of the project is how do you define what, what is important in terms of archives and what do you define as being historically important? I, I remember reading the recent report for the, um, the National Archives uh, guidelines to use AI. And uh, there was this central question to decide what, what is historically important um, and what should be kept. Basically, the, the main question is, is there. What I suggested in my, in my first question is that a project like this focuses on hidden archives and hidden connections. And I think one of the potential applications of, of the visualizations, the AI-based visualizations and uh, treatment we, we want to, um, to apply to our database is specifically to try and quantify regularities and anomalies in terms of how visual culture developed in the late 19th century and early 20th, early 20th century. How do you define the sampling of what's mainstream, what's uh, visually um, uh, uh, novel, transforma transformative, disruptive, and I think that kind of global take, if you use uh, object detection, if you use image similarity, is something that could be extremely useful. Think about, for instance, how are we going to archive the, the mass amount of images from the war in Ukraine right, right now? What is going to be, uh, for the future, uh, something that is historically important? Is that the, the mass of images showing, showing prisoners of wars or uh, ruins in Mariupol, or is it, I don't know, maybe an image that is already saying something new uh, about uh, how the war is unfolded. And I think the outliers, how AI can vectorize and help us understand patterns and motifs in the, um, the, the, the mass large, of Im large visual corpus is something that can be extremely useful. The difficulty is it's really a frontier right now. Uh, scene understanding is really difficult, specifically when you apply it to uh, visual material. And um, uh, another very uh, hands-on approach uh, to this is one of the features we want to develop is image similarity. So say you've got a amateur photograph uh, album of photos from the late 19th century, early 20th century, a database like ours, specifically on colonial terrains, would be super helpful to identify uh, some of the images in the album uh, and to try and confront that album with a larger database to see whether it's specifically interesting or very different um, and gives, give, gives people more landscape into which uh, you could place that specific document. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else wants to add something? Marina, I see you saying. Marina, did you want to add something? Um, no, it's okay for me. All right, any other questions from the audience uh, to our wonderful panelists? And so maybe one thing I want to ask you, Dr. Foya and the, the entire team is how, um, where can actually uh, 
like what's the end game if i may put it this way so you're going to develop a model that you feel like no what uh, activists can use so um have you considered the cost or is it going to be possible that you know what uh um libraries or archives like small institution are they going to be able to afford what is it that you're going to develop so what is uh, when it comes to that uh, in terms yeah. of cost? Yeah, so let, maybe let me answer this one. I think um, all the project is there on open science, uh, fair principles. Um, so uh, part of the technologies uh, we are aiming at uh, providing solutions that could be very frugal in nature. Um, uh, what we don't have, we, we've got funds for this project, but obviously we're looking into very effective uses of what we have to make sure we, we get to the point where object detection, automated, se semi-automated um, uh, object uh, detection and uh, metadata, me metadata augmentation is something frugal. I, I'm not sure uh, this would be systematically an obstacle on the long term, okay? The, the cost of GPU power is gonna decrease radically uh, over time. Um, it's obviously something to be considered, uh, and uh, we, we clearly have this in mind because part of the material we are going to use uh, obviously should go back to source communities and local archives, and that, there should be a connection between the very large partners we have and smaller, uh, I mean, less well-funded partners elsewhere in the world. So that's something we will do at a second stage, uh, looking for additional funding. All right, thank you so much for that. And so the other question that I have, why people are, I think the audience is a little bit shy, but one other question that I have for you is when you think what kind of advice, let me put it that way, will you give to anyone who would like to engage in uh, using artificial intelligence or archival appraisal and selection based on what you've been doing so far? Because I saw uh, the presentation, or the colleague present, like what kind of advice will you give people and what will we consider understanding this historical biases that you already mentioned and actually know it in the digital archives, in the archives that you have, the photographs that you have so far? I think um, one of the solutions is typically the kind of project, I'm not overselling the project, I'm just saying uh, that kind of interconnected project that interconnects different uh, uh, expertise, different forms of expertise. I'm a historian uh, Sumik is really trained in artificial intelligence. He, he worked on medical image, imaging. Uh, Marina comes from data structuring. She, she was trained at the Ecole des Chartes, which is one of the, the most famous uh, archivist school, <laughs> schools in, in France. So I think it's very important that we have a sort of hands-on approach to start talking about real stuff. How do we uh, solve tiny problems first? So we, uh, Sumik uh, explained to you how we're going to extract uh, a, a, a lot of a lot of um, material. Uh, they, I think we have to 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 work on this. Very large guidelines are interesting. Uh, smaller projects like this one are ways to experiment how to in, to connect these ethical problems, uh, technological problems. Um, specific. Uh, yeah, I see a, 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 a question by Luis uh, Estev. Um, this model is performed for specific, yeah. Um, it's gonna adapt to other um, projects. Uh, if you look up what Julien Shi is, one of the, the PI in the project, he already developed with Marina specific tools to extract text and images uh, that are freely available online and are super effective on a wide range of material. So the first stage of the project is to, um, we have a, a database of uh, original photographs coming from the different partners. So. Uh, photographic albums, uh, individual prints, you name it, fascinating material. I didn't show any of that, but uh, what we're looking to create in addition to this is a huge mass of printed photographs from this, the very same period to trace circulations, uh, textual contexts, uh, reuses, resignifications. The kind of layout analysis uh, we hope to, to, to be able to do is typically something that could be applied to a, lot, a wide range of material say uh, a Turkish newspaper, illustrated newspaper from the early 20th century. Um, the technology there is, is transferable. 
Um, what we're going to do is to adapt layout uh, data sets from the, the late 20th, early 21st century to late 90th, uh, early 20th century. And then we're going to move on to image segmentation and layout understanding for photographic albums with the hope to extract single images at item level, which is something that is super hard to do for humans in an archive. And if it works well enough, it's typically the kind of technology that could be transferred for nothing um, very easily uh, to, to, to be used at archive level, in, even in small institutions. Uh, we're actually, some of the institutions we're working with don't have the kind of money you would need to describe an album at item level with all the captions. Uh, we, we're trying to develop solutions, tiny steps, but solutions to, to do that and to bring that material out of the archives to make sure that people can actually interact with them and work on them. Thank you so much for that, uh, Daniel. I don't know if you have, a, we have another question from the audience. Uh, anyone has another question that they want to feel like they need to put uh, in the chat? And uh, yeah, just uh, getting the question now. Okay, all right. So uh, there was a um, question about metadata. Maybe Marina, can you answer yes, this one? Yeah, I, I just hit it. Uh, I'm actually working on the metadata on the project, and it's a very complicated um, issue we have because I, um, um, I we said we collect the data from very a lot of different institutions, and then there there is uh, from the beginning a lot of different uh, types of metadata some of them are not on the um, are just excel files or are just uh, don't exist at all uh, so we have to for some of them create it uh, and for the other um, uh, translate it and make a format uh, um, um, to normalize the format of every uh, metadata we have um, and in the for the metadata, which are like some Dublin core or some already uh, normalized uh, format, we can, I am collected from like the APA and automatically from, uh, from the, from the terms uh, we, we was interested in and uh, we will manage to organize it, uh, everything uh, around the model, uh, a data model and we probably stay on the Dublin core uh, principles and model which existing in France. Um, well, it's okay. I don't know if it answers to to the question. Yeah, thank you, Marina. So the other question that I think you have, I can only now for asking the question. The other question that I have in the next couple of minutes that we have with the, our panel is, I, I'm a, a little bit curious, but how, when you 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 mentioned in your project, you're going to take images from colonial, right, uh, the time of uh, colonial war and things like colonial armies. And how do you, now that you're going to put them in public, I remember you uh, talking about that, Daniel, uh, how do you see the, the sensitivity of the people who are going to be put out there. How are you planning to address all of that? And, and what kind of advice? I know you kind of, those are ideas, but what kind of advice or what kind of uh, caution do you feel like when we're dealing with data like that, people will, should take in terms of, you know, uh, this historical biases that have been- Sure, embedded. I mean, it's beyond the colonial wars. We, we've got some very graphic material because um, some of the funds we're getting are from the, the First World War amateur uh, production and uh, I don't know if you know it but it, it was very blunt and direct and graphic in the way it uh, some soldiers documented the war it's very far from the kind of um, no dead people in the images kind of principle you you you, th you would think about you would project on that period uh, we've got some very very violent um, images so uh, there will be trigger warnings obviously on the demo website um, beforehand, clearly identifying uh, problems that it could raise for uh, source communities in particular. Um, the second protection will be individual, we, we're aiming at individual tagging of, um, of very graphic images. I don't think we can afford not looking at, we don't have that huge an amount of images to look at. Um, we, there's enough of us to, to make sure we 
cover most of the most difficult photograph. Uh, the June um, workshop in Brawley is on the more problematic images, the one that are not graphic, but the one that convey humiliation, uh, prisoners, for instance, uh, leaders in exile, if you think about uh, French and British colonization of uh, Africa, for instance, um, people that are going to be executed, you know that because of the caption, but there's no graphic dimension to the image. Um, it's still very much a second stage of that project. Uh, we want first to have a, this hands-on approach. Every institution that will tell us, we don't want that on the demo website. We obviously gonna uh, make sure we, we don't. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna follow their guidelines uh, very strictly on, on the matter. But we, we're thinking a lot about this and more specifically about the, the images in between, okay? The ones that do not look violent as such are potentially sensitive and are sometimes the more difficult to watch for some, for some communities. Thank you so much for that. And I think we, we're coming up to the, the hour. And so, and we have a last question here. So, okay. So me too, right. so this one. I think, that, I, think, I think that question will answer, right? For, uh, for the resident 50, it's a good question, yeah. but right now we are using some of the spirit and model that already exists. So we are choosing the resident 50 to see that how our existing data set is working on, on it. So probably it could be changed in the future. So, because it is very early stage. So that's why. All right. Thank you so much to our team. Thank you so much, Thank Daniel. Uh, this was uh, to, to leave Marina and I uh, forgot your name, uh, but Thank you so much. My apologies. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. And then uh, thank you for sharing your work, but also uh, start helping us kind of start addressing this issue of historical biases. And then when we're using AI, some of the questions that we're asking, and then we hope to see you here again tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be our thing where we trying to bring, we having all these presentations so that we can start having, developing a kind of a share uh, on the share framework where we can actually have some kind of guidelines that people can follow when it comes time to applying AI in archival selection and uh, appraisal. So thank you again. And then mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for spending that time with us here. So we're opening up to our next guest speaker. And then I hope you guys are going to stay by. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can allow uh, Dr. Suvik to share his screen. So why doctor, um, he actually loves to be called, he allows me to call him Vic Gosh. So I'm going to call him Dr. Uh, Dr. Vic Gosh. So um, he is a tenure track assistant professor at the School of Information. And his scholarship involve, involves the development of research models and methods that extend the traditional view of information seeking into voice-based and interactive environments. So Dr. Vic, today, there's just so much that we can say about him, but today he's going to address the question of selection appraisal biases with artificial intelligence. So now, and again, just like we deal with the team of Dr. Liz and uh, Dr. Daniel and with Marina, and then after his presentation, definitely going to open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. Dr. Vic, go ahead. Thanks, Rebecca. And again, good morning, everyone, and good evening or afternoon, based on wherever you are. And uh, I think, uh, at first, I want to congratulate uh, Daniel and his team on, on a very interesting and wonderful presentation. And I think that kind of uh, creates a perfect segue into what I'm going to present. And so the topic, what I'm, I'm, I'm presenting today is like how to address selection and appraisal biases with AI or artificial intelligence. And Again, like just before I start, I think Rebecca gave, gave a pretty fair introduction. And I'm an assistant professor at uh, San Jose State University School of Information. I am also an AI consultant for the Interpares Trust AI project. And uh, that's a multidisciplinary multinational project, uh, which aims to design, develop and leverage AI to support uh, different trust uh, like the ongoing availability, accessibility of trustworthy public records. So I think that's what we are doing. And again, my, I'm, I'm an AI person based on my background. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and my research interest is mostly in conversational AI. I also do social media analytics. Uh, 
I use a bunch of different uh, research techniques, mostly involving application of deep neural nets and some human computer interaction techniques and to work in the NLP domain, but mostly socio-technical aspects, which, which needs to be addressed, some of those problems which, which are relevant and which, which needs to be handled with AI. And that's what created my, my association with Interpress Trust AI because they were working in the uh, archives and uh, public repository domains and on which I had no experience in uh, prior to my involvement. And so they roped me in and I have been working with them and we realized there exists this wonderful opportunity where we, we can apply some of those AI techniques in, in archival domain. And archival science, I think, has, has been more careful about uh, fairness, about uh, creating like uh, very standard documentations, which, which computer science hasn't done so far. And just a huge shout out to the two projects I'm involved with. One is the Employing AI for Retention and Disposition interested digital record keeping repositories. And the other one is personal information content assessment. So both of them are part of uh, Interpress project. And I could actually, I'll, I'll drop the link uh, once I'm done with my presentation. So as for today's agenda, so I'm, I'm not going to draw anything from my present or past projects just because uh, conversational AI is very different from archival science in, in, in principle and again, some of the projects which we are working on right now, they are they're at very beginning stages. So I wouldn't want to drop on them. It's, it's more like theoretical and I will do a, uh, something, I'll, I'll start with the domain of archival science and the types of biases, which again, have used uh, the literature to identify for our projects and some of the techniques which we can use to mitigate those biases. And finally, I would walk you through a code which I have on my computer on how to unbias the data. And finally, we will do a Q&A, but at any point during the presentation, if you feel you have a question which requires addressing right away, or you're, you're going to leave the presentation, you want your question answered, please stop me and uh, unmute yourself asking the question. I don't mind answering the questions uh, during presentation either. So first, I think I think Daniel and his team, they, they, they kind of like, poked around in the historical records and what are the different gaps, right? And we have all heard the phase, like there are gaps in historical record based on who writes those records. And this is not a new concept, definitely not hard to understand. And uh, institutions have traditionally, and they, they often prioritize the voices of those in power. So even we are seeing the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, but we do not know how this is going to be represented uh, a century later, or maybe a millennium later, how, how we are going to see it being recorded. What we see is certain people, communities, uh, groups, movements, they do not have their stories selected. Their stories are not included in the collection of libraries, archives, museums, uh, personal collections. Now, archivists and librarians, they, they try to be neutral and should ideally, they should evaluate sources to add the collection based only on the potential value to researchers and the historical record. But when we talk about potential values, that brings around uh, an amount of subjectivity. And since we are talking about humans who are still part of the society and therefore those biases, the societal biases, cultural biases, they will impact the work of archivists and librarians just like they would anyone else. So these biases can have some impact on what gets selected, what gets appraised, and can lead to marginalized communities not being included and their stories being left out. So this is, a, this is a quote which I liked when I was reading through the literature. This is from Dominic Luster, who's uh, with the Carnegie Museum of Art. And what it says, like, we implicitly trust the evidence that we find in an archive, but we tend to overlook biased decision-making practices of the archivist or the history gatekeeper about what you found in that archive and what you didn't. So there are also communities that do not want their historical collections uh, in care of third-party institutions. Uh, for example, we know in, in the United States, we see the Native American community. There are separate protocols on how their information uh, can be shared and can be presented, can be archived by the, and these are highlighted by the American Historical Association. As for the appraisal decisions, uh, this is one of the core archival functions and it's done at the collection, at the creator level, at the file or item level even. And but how is this decision made? So an archivist, again, would consider a number of factors, including the records provenance and content, their authenticity and reliability, 
their order and completeness and their condition, the cost to preserve them, intrinsic value, and so on. Now, it also depends on the institutional collection policy and the mission statement. But before we develop uh, any automated model or AI solution, we need to acknowledge that there are those unseen potential biases, which I spoke before. And to develop an unbiased solution, the appraisal decisions need to be documented clearly and all biases should be accounted for. And uh, on the plus side, like I mentioned before, unlike the machine learning and AI domain, archives have very clearly stated motives and institutional policies. There's the mission statement that defines the concept and uh, to collect data on. And there are full-time curators who know what they're doing and they are responsible for weighing the risks and benefits uh, for while archiving the data. There are theoretical frameworks in place and there exists the code of uh, ethics and conduct and professional framework on how they should be enforced. And also the standardized forms of documentation. We do not see that in computer science or machine learning domain. And finally, I'll, I'll jump into how AI can help with uh, algorithmic fairness. So often when I encounter people outside the, outside the domain of computer science, I think there's some, uh, it needs to be defined what we mean by an AI. Uh, when I'm talking about my research, I consider AI as an umbrella term, which is used to describe a range of intelligent activities which are performed by the machine. And that could include learning, reasoning, and logic. Uh, machine learning and deep learning, they are techniques which we use to develop AI systems. So when we say AI, what we really mean is autonomous decision making of some sort, something a human would have done. We are just using a system to do that. Now it could be prediction, classification, recommendation, or any other intelligent task. And the system just works on the input data, uh, performs some learning, and converts it into prediction or insights. So in this presentation, when I say AI, I also include ML, uh, machine learning, and deep learning interchangeably. In now, AI systems, and a lot of work has been done, there has been publicity on it as well, like they are known to be unfair. Uh, when deployed for everyday life functions, uh, we have had very biased results and predictions. We saw it with different immigration algorithms, placement algorithms, uh, face recognition applications, uh, search engines. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Sophia Noble, she has a wonderful book on how AI can amplify the racial and uh, social biases. And if you haven't, you should, you should take a look at it. And uh, there, it's important for researchers and also engineers uh, to be concerned about what the potential harmful effects could be when we are developing an algorithm or a system. Now, as we discussed in previous slides, the decisions uh, made in archives regarding selection and appraisal, of course, they can be automated using AI system. And, and I'm, a, I'm a very optimistic about the power of AI because of my background, I think, we can implement algorithms for everything, how well they work and how well they take care of uh, the potential harms. That's a big question we need to answer because yes, we can develop algorithms, but uh, should we, or how should we develop those? So these biases, they will not be depicted uh, in autonomous selection and appraisal, uh, but the types of biases uh, that, that goes way deeper and we have to have some awareness about them. So first, uh, this is a diagram which was, uh, which I found in the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And this report acknowledges that a great deal of AI bias, it stems from human biases and systemic institutional biases as well. Now the computational or statistical biases, they are easy to remedy and, and we will get to the point where we can remedy them. But the human and systemic biases, they are much harder to deal with. And when we are looking at AI systems, uh, although GPU is getting cheaper and we have storage spaces we are, which are much cheaper than 10 years back, but they're still expensive to develop because we need uh, people with those skill sets to come in and develop and that doesn't come in uh, for cheap. And, so, and we, so we apply those AI systems in areas which have the maximum impact. For example, say healthcare, finance, uh, and uh, self-driving cars and so on. But when you think of such systems, they could be extremely helpful, but they could also cause a tremendous amount of harm. And the, those impacts stemming from AI are not just at the individual or enterprise level, but they are part of the broader society as well. So uh, it can be perpetrated, the speed at which this kind of biases, they kind of like perpetrated by AI applications. 
and uh, large machine learning models, for example, like uh, the kind of biases, the kind of racism they propagate, it goes across domains and industries. And that's why it requires extreme caution. And current attempts for addressing such harmful effects remain focused mostly on computational factors, such as uh, how can we make the data sets more representative? And I actually will walk you through that and the fairness of machine learning algorithms. Now, these remedies, they're vital for mitigating bias and something which uh, as AI experts, we can definitely do. But that, that's again on computational or statistical level. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, as you can see in the, in the figure here. Uh, what we do need to do and to do work on the human and systemic biases, because those are not always visible. The societal factors, the institutional factors, they are significant sources of AI bias and are currently overlooked. Successfully meeting this challenge that will require taking all forms of bias into account, making it more interdisciplinary, I would even say transdisciplinary approaches, and where, where we include people from different walks of life. For example, both AI researchers and archivists, we will have to expand our perspectives beyond the machine learning pipeline. We have to investigate into how the technology is created, to where the impact points lie. And because AI, after all, it's, it's not a magic pill. It is, it's often glamorized, and uh, but uh, there are issues which needs to be dealt with. Now, if you look at this image here, I'll, I'll walk very quickly through each of them in the subsequent slides, but you can look at the three types of biases. So we already spoke about the computational biases, which you can see in the middle. And these are some of them, some of those biases, but there are also data biases which relates to how the data is collected, how it's uh, measured, if it's a representative sample. And then there's also the human or the user biases, which includes the systemic biases as well. Now I have drawn a feedback loop because often these biases, they feed onto each other and that's what creates a very vicious cycle. So if you look into the figure, you could see the data biases, what they do uh, when we build our computational models, we use this data to train our, train our algorithms. And if the data is biased, so will be our algorithm. So now we have a biased algorithm. And again, this biased algorithm, they project those impacts, those harmful effects on the end users or, or the humans in the loop. So again, it's, it's finally it affects the end users. And again, the systemic biases or the biases which we find in our everyday society, they get reflected when we communicate. So imagine a racist person talking on Twitter or on Reddit. And of course, their opinions, their biased opinions will be reflected in what they post. And that inherently biases the data. And that data again will bias our algorithm. So it, it's a vicious cycle. It will keep repeating itself unless we know where to pull the plug and how we can remedy those situations. So let's look at the different type of biases here. And these are the data biases. And we see that there's measurement biases, which often rise uh, based on how we choose to utilize or measure certain features. So for example, like the data set we shall be working with today is the recidivism risk prediction tool, uh, Compass. And that data was collected to see if the prior arrests or the friend or family uh, information could be used as proxy variables to measure the level of riskiness uh, or the crime that the individual is going to commit in future. So. The problem with that is the minority communities, they are controlled and policed more frequently. And they often face like a higher arrest rate as well. And this is just, and this data set was collected in the United States. So in, in the, in actually the Broward County, which is 20 minutes from where I live in Florida. And one of the, one of the problems with that is uh, because the minority communities are being treated like that, and there's a systemic racial injustice in the United States. So people coming from these minority groups, they will have higher arrest rate and they will be treated as more dangerous by this algorithm when, when it works, any algorithm which works on this data. And I'll, again, I will, I'll come to that when, when I end my presentation. And there's also the omitted variable bias, which occurs when one or more important variables are left out of the model. For example, say we often try to get the lowest hanging fruits. And if we are missing out on some of the variables, because they're harder to collect or harder to generate, that will create a bias in the system. Representation bias, again, it's, it's how we sample the population. Uh, our, our sample may lack diversity. It may not be a proper representative sample of our uh, end users of our population. 
there's aggregation bias when false conclusions are drawn because uh, when we observe the entire population and we draw some conclusion, but what we don't do is going to the subgroups which are involved. And that's what is involved with Simpson paradox, which says that uh, when you're analyzing heterogeneous data, you often see certain kind of patterns in the subgroups, but when you aggregate those information, uh, those uh, observations actually disappear. So you are unable to see it. And the same goes with the modifiable real unit problem, which looks at the spatial uh, biases. So which geographical location we're actually working with. Uh, there's sampling bias, which again is similar to representative representation bias and because of non-random non -random sampling of subgroups. So one of the subgroups we are working with more frequently and, and we the statistical significance which we find is because of how we sample the data and not uh, because of the data itself. And there's longitudinal data fallacy because uh, certain researchers, when we work with longitudinal data, we do not really want to wait that long. So what we end up doing, we take a cross section of the data. So imagine we are working with Twitter data and we want to see how the, how the pandemic has impacted uh, how people tweet about uh, COVID-19. And instead of going over the last two years data, what we do is we take a snapshot of the data and we try to analyze how the user's pattern have changed. And we look at uh, different uh, groups of people instead of looking uh, at the longitudinal data itself. And a lot of research work has been done like this. And so the findings are often not representative of how it should be ideally. And then there's linking bias, which is caused because of uh, the user connections, activities, or interactions uh, on social networks. And they misrepresent the true behavior of the users. There are uh, low degree nodes uh, in social media networks that, that often influence uh, how we kind of find these results. So again, we have to be careful about those. Next, there's computational biases. And again, these biases, these are easy to deal with because we have, uh, First, we have the algorithmic bias, which is uh, not present in the input data. So it's not related to data at all, but is added purely by algorithm. Uh, what design choices we make, the kind of optimization algorithms we use, uh, the different loss functions, and so on. There's user interaction bias that's uh, not only observed on the web, but also gets triggered when the user interacts with the user interface. And it's a, it's a self-selected bias uh, and so, uh, because based on the click behavior of the user and the interaction with the UX design. And then there's the presentation bias, which again is how the information is presented. Uh, as users, when you click on some of the content, that's the content which you see. If the content is not presented to you, you do not get to see that content. And again, that leads to the ranking bias. Again, it has been seen that search engines, whatever result we give, people often click on the first two or three results. They don't even go to, they never, al almost never go to the next page. And they most definitely go beyond the first 10 results. And that kind of creates bias because how we present the result influences how the user think of the, of the issues or what they're looking for, the information. But there's popularity biases, of course. And this is kind of, uh, we see it when, when we look at social bots and the fake reviews, because items which are more popular, they tend to generate uh, more, they are exposed more and other people get recommended uh, more of that same content. And it occurs in search engines, recommender systems, uh, and so on. Uh, the emergent bias, again, it occurs when the users, they interact with the system. And suddenly there's a change in outlook, population, like cultural values, societal knowledge, which leads to a design change. And suddenly uh, what data we collected do not work that well. And this is again common in user interfaces. And finally, there's the evaluation bias, which occurs during model evaluation. And we use inappropriate benchmarks for evaluation of algorithms. And so these benchmarks kind of make us feel that systems like a facial recognition system, they are not biased towards a particular skin color or gender, but these benchmarks uh, needs to be changed. And we need to pick the right benchmarks and right evaluation metric to, to kind of like counteract this bias. And finally, the human biases, which again, it's, it's hard to deal with. And historical biases uh, it already exist in, in our society and there's a uh, socio-technical issues in the world and we can see them seep into the data generation process. Even if we do a perfect sampling, perfect feature generation, uh, women CEOs, uh, they, they are fewer compared to male CEOs. And this is due to the 
glass ceiling which exists in organizational culture. But if our model is trained on a data which has 5% women CEOs, uh, then it will soon learn that, and if it is then used to make a decision on who should be hired as CEO, it will try to eliminate, uh, it wouldn't recommend a women CEO to anyone who uses that data to train. Similarly, the population bias that arises when, when the statistics, uh, the demographics are different of the user population and which, which are using the platform or, or the system and the original target population. So again, this is a problem of non-representative data where the user demographics is different in the, across different platforms. But the self-selection bias, it's a, it's a sampling bias or it's a, sub, it's a type of sampling bias in which subjects select themselves. For example, think about electoral polls. People who are willing to work on it are, are the people who, uh, who are more enthusiastic about elections. Same with social biases, which happens uh, with reviews and ratings. Behavioral biases, which occur user behavior across platforms, context, different data sets. Temporal biases, they, they are differences, uh, arises from the differences in population and behavior over time. Now you can see uh, when people start talking about a topic on Twitter, they will often use hashtags uh, to capture attention. But as they keep talking about it, then the hashtags are, uh, they do not uh, use the hashtags anymore. So those also cause some biases. And finally, there's content production biases, which arises from the structural, lexical, semantic, and syntactic differences in the content genre. So I'm looking more at the natural language perspectives and how, how you use the language differently and how that biases the system. So although these, are, these should not bias the results, but a machine could treat them as proxies uh, for people of different cultures. Uh, say, uh, as an Indian, I may be using some words more than others, or I may have a particular style of writing. Same goes for, for other people of color, uh, non-white speakers of, of the language, non-native speakers, uh, different age groups, maybe millennials talk differently than, than other people, the ethnicity. So I think those will lead to the bias, although they do not have a direct effect, but they could be treated as proxies. Now let's look at how we can mitigate those AI biases, because as I said, uh, the computation biases are easy to remedy, but human and systemic biases are not. So first we will have to make sure that we, we delegate those decision making to algorithms because it's, it's appealing, it's fast, it's, it's more productive and the results are also more consistent. We, they do not have the subjectivity we see in humans. So now the problem is we need to, without any direct supervision of these models, uh, they could use proxies as I, as I showed in the last slide and which could create many risks. And we need to deal with these biases at every step of the development from requirement analysis to model development, and finally the post-deployment feedback. Uh, software developers and uh, ML researchers, they should work closely with the organizations deploying this. And they should do periodic model updates, uh, recalibrate the model parameters based on user feedback, and also make sure that, that there's no major uh, biases which, which, are being, uh, which have been targeting sections of the end users. Now, First, we'll look into fair AI development and while addressing biases uh, will we'll involve all parties and at every step, uh, it will also involve more focus on the algorithmic side. And that's where I think uh, software developers and ML engineers come into play. One, we have to target biasing during pre-processing, in-processing, which is the algorithmic development stage and post-processing stages. So at all stages. And we will have to transform the data so that the underlying discrimination is removed. So that's a data processing step. And then we will do uh, how to modify and change the state of the art learning algorithms to remove discrimination during the model training phases. And uh, finally, uh, if, if we are using a black box model, then we can only do post-processing because sometimes the model is not available for tweaking once we, have, we are in production mode or post-production mode. So only way we can deal with those biases is through post-processing techniques. And so we can do that as well. So first to remove data biases. And like, like we discussed, every data set, we, it incorporates several design decisions made by the data curator. And that could lead to some of the biases. And in order to mitigate those effects, uh, some general methods have been proposed that advocate having good practices while using the data and having data sheets that would act as supporting documents for the data. And they also report the data creation method, 
the characteristics of the data, the motivations for collecting the data, and the different skews in the data. And some researchers have proposed methods to test for cases of Simpson's paradox in the data. Others have used causal models and graphs which direct this direct discrimination in the data. So if you're looking at a causal graph, you would see uh, the arrows move, going from the cause to the effect. And if you see that a particular effect is being caused by a factor which shouldn't be having a causal effect, then you know that's that's probably due to one of the biases. And there are also several prevention techniques, such as uh, messaging, preferential sampling, disparate impact removal, and then Cameron and Calders, I think they, they, they wrote at least four or five papers which talks about them in more detail, so I won't go into that, but you can definitely consult those papers. And these techniques, they modify the data in a way that the predictions they do not use, at least they do not use direct discrimination. The next step would be to use fair machine learning methods. And uh, researchers have developed fair classifiers to satisfy subgroup fairness in classification, used preferential sampling to produce discrimination-free training data sets. And the other methods uh, try to use stability of results even when we use multiple test sets using random sampling. Uh, modifications have been made to existing classifiers like NIPE-based, and we've also added fairness constraints to multitask learning frameworks. And in addition to that, uh, this approach can not only impose fairness during training, it will also benefit the minority groups by focusing on, they will maximize the average accuracy of each group, so of each subgroup as opposed to maximizing the accuracy as a whole. So that way we are looking into the smaller groups as well. And then there's decoupled classification systems. Again, that's another solution where we use separate classifier for each of the groups. And uh, transfer learning, I, I remember uh, Daniel uh, and uh, Shomik, they were talking about transfer learning and that could also help reduce the effect of having less data for minority groups. And some of the recent works have also used accuracy fairness trade-offs to find the right sweet spot where we should stop concerning about accuracy and, uh, and focus more on the fairness instead. There are community, community detection modules and causal graphs. And then there is a uh, last of the algorithmic ways is to ensure fair embeddings for large scale language models. And fair representations can help us uh, avoid the unfair interference of sensitive attributes. And this concept has been tackled in quite a few research papers uh, because for example, we often see in the machine learns that a man is equal to a computer programmer, whereas a woman could be a homemaker. When we talk about doctor, that would be a male title, whereas a female gets assigned a nurse title. So these are the kind of biases like, and these sensitive variables, they can also be treated as nuisance variable and we can remove the information about that variable to get a fair representation. So we do not need to have the gender variable present per se, but we could replace them with tags. Similarly, there are uh, work done on algorithmic front. So there's a uh, fair uh, GAN systems, which generate synthetic data that is de-biased and we, they can be used instead of the real data for training. And in this approach, the goal is not to remove discrimination from the data set, but instead generate new data points, which are similar to the real one, which are de-biased and preserves good data quality. Now the, what the generator, GANs often involve the generator and the discriminator. So the generator will generate fake data which are conditioned on the protected attribute and the discriminator on the other hand, it will, it will be optimized to differentiate the real data from the fake data. Another popular approach is uh, how to de-bias word embeddings by uh, creating gender neutral words. And uh, for those, we will, we will remove all gender information. Similarly, named entities, they should be de-biased to remove associated gender effects because again, they could be, names could be used as proxies uh, for gender as well. Now, apart from the algorithmic steps, I would uh, like to end with pointing out the non-algorithmic steps which are there, which is again, raising awareness about the potential biases. And I think this, uh, this seminar, this workshop, uh, these are kind of like a perfect example of that where, where we are in involving the audience and uh, they are aware of what can be done. And once deployed, the original idea can drift and the uh, application which is using AI, it can be repurposed in unforeseen ways. And so different deployment contexts, if we develop a same AI solution and it's used different places, new risks must be considered. And we have to engage with a broader set of uh, stakeholders who will be impacted by, by these technologies. And again, governance without accountability is, is not going to be effective. So we have to make sure that uh, a team is, is responsible for the algorithmic developments 
and they are they are legally they could be legally charged in case something goes wrong and proper documentation is maintained for the models uh, for the context of accountability and we also when we develop ai solution we request subject matter expertise but again these experts they are not ai experts i'm working with uh, expert archivists but uh, i am not an archivist myself and they are not an ai developer themselves so in order to make sure that those biases do not exist we should collaborate more often because the wheels need not be reinvented on all sides we we can bring in experts from different areas and we could form a committee form form a group who who are looking into the ai biases and uh, this this will help us develop more effective uh, oversight policies and and guidelines and again rebecca mentioned we are going to do something like that tomorrow when when we'll talk about the next steps and uh, also we have to make sure that we are following consistent development and testing practices some of them are highlighted by nist and they they could help in ensuring that ai related risks are continuously mapped they are measured and they are managed throughout the ai life cycle now that was my presentation if i have some time rebecca i'll i'll actually uh, go over one of the code snippets which i have with me just to walk you th through through one of the data debiasing technique which which i was working on so these are some of the references which i have used for this presentation and for my work they are actually very pertinent and thank you so much dr thika i think i'm going to give you a uh, time I, I guess the audience uh, would love to see uh, right okay. so you know, okay so i think i'm de definitely going to give you some time to kind of okay show us at least yes why it is go ahead yeah there you go people say thank this. you uh -huh. So here what I have used the compass data set and like I mentioned this data set is is to calculate the recidivism risk score so a person who has some criminal uh, activity before are they more likely to uh, commit a crime in future so again I have used the fairlens library which is an again open source python library for discovering bias and again dealing with those biases how this algorithm works is it it compares I have run it for the sake of time it compares the distribution of the original data and the distribution of the subgroups to figure out uh, if there exists some bias and when we look at the distance the weighted distance between those subgroups to see uh, if we can say that there exists a bias and again let me walk through that so again you can see this is the this is the data set which i imported here on my data frame so it has 2280 rows and 22 columns all all these are features and this raw score is actually the score which shows if they are likely to commit crime now what this library allows us to do is allows us to uh, use a different statistical distance measures to measure the difference between the distribution of a variable into potential sensitive subgroups so what i did here i used the raw score as my target variable and used the ethnicity of african american and caucasian and i'm calculating if if what's the distance between those two because ideally there shouldn't be a distance if it's a fair algorithm but we do see that there's exists a distance of 0.26 by kolomogorov uh, smirnov distance and that's something which shows that there might be some bias happening here and again i checked the p value the is not significant so which makes me think that maybe there's there's uh, there's no biases here because at least it's not statistically significant so then i went ahead and tried to detect the sensitive attributes and the the library helps me say that the dates of birth will directly relate to age ethnicity language will lead to nationality marital status will give rise to family status and sex with gender so these could be some of the sensitive attributes and based on the features it automatically detects if any of the feature will contribute towards any of the sensitive attributes and then to see if there's uh, any proxies and like i said a name could be used as a proxy for gender we generated this this uh, correlation graph and here again if you look at this heat map you could see that if you look at sex you could actually see that first name and last name here they actually have some effect with with the gender and that could actually even the middle and that could actually they reflect on the ethnicity of the person we see there's a heat map with ethnicity there's also some correlation with sex uh, or the gender so definitely this will lead act as proxies and will lead to some kind of bias in the data and finally what i have done is i have used the same data set and i've i've tried to calculate the fairness scores i've used their fairness scorer which is a model and i've passed my 
data frame the data along with the raw score variable. And I asked the algorithm to figure out if there exists a significant difference between the between the groups, how far they are in terms of the distribution wise. And you can see this, all of these groups, they are actually statistically significant because all the p-values are less than 0.05. They are at a distance from the original distribution, which shows all these groups will be treated as they are different from the original population. So any findings which we have, they will have likely have some impact. They, they will likely have some biases. And this is the weighted mean statistical distance. And I could see the distance is 0.186. And this is, again, very, very much visible if you look at the distribution as well. Again, nothing speaks better than a diagram for, uh, for everyone, right? So we can see that the gender distribution, if you, let's say yes, the gender distribution, if you look at the male and the female distribution, they are different from the overall distribution of the, of the data set. If you look at the ethnicity, you will also see this is the green one is the Caucasian one, the orange one is the African American, and the red one are the Hispanic. They are very different in their own ways from the original distribution itself. Uh, the same goes with date of birth, which means that based on the age of the age of the target users, the algorithm could say like he's more likely to commit more crime if he's maybe younger, or he's more likely to commit crime crime if he's a Hispanic person or like an African American person. So those biases will exist there. So now what I did here is I tried to remove the biases now. Again, I asked for a report of uh, using another distance metric, distance to the rest of the groups, because previously we were checking with the whole population. Now I, had, I checked with the rest of the groups. And again, I found the weighted mean score is 0.25. So previously it was 0.18. Now I see if I consider within group differences, that's 0.25. To remove the biases, and I, I, we realized that the data set contain unfair amount of, uh, so the, it, it has a bias distribution. So the counts, are different for different groups. So in order to balance out the count, what I did is there are techniques, right? There are techniques where uh, minority oversampling and undersampling, uh, majority undersampling techniques, what it does is remove instances of the majority group or adds examples of the minority group. That works better than not having it at all. Uh, there's also the synthetic minority oversampling technique. What it does is between two minority points, if I have two points which belong to a minority class, I'll draw a line and pick a random spot in between on, on that line to generate newer data points. Again, SMOT also works pretty well, but not as much as we would like. So here I have used a new technique, which actually uses the data to learn all the statistical features. And once it learns the statistical features, then it will generate those synthetic data points without increasing the skew, without, in, in, like, without distorting the distribution of the data but it adds newer data points based on all the statistical features which my model had to begin with. So you could see I have done a rebalancing here. What I did is I used, I extracted all the data points, created a higher dimensional data, and then trained my model using that. So it, it learned about the data, all the statistical features, and then I asked it to balance the data set. Now I want males to be 50% and females to be 50% as well. So I'm trying to make it more gender neutral, so at least removing the gender biases. And again, now the data set has been produced and you can see the weighted distance has decreased from 0.18 to 0.13. And if you look at the gender bias here, you would see that the two distributions now look fairly the same. So we can say like, at least we have removed the gender biases. Now, again, if you look, and I, I asked the algorithm to remove all the biases by itself. The gender one, I specifically said what distribution I want. For the others, I let it do its own thing. And again, you could see that now I see the Caucasian and the African-American are similar, but not the other ethnicities. So other ethnicities are not quite. So what I ended up with doing is I specified the distribution. I hard-coded it. I mentioned what distribution I wanted to. And then again, I generated this data. So now you could see all the ethnical ethnicity features based on the ethnicity, they have the similar counts which shows that at least I've again balanced out the ethnicity along with the gender. And again, the score is 0.13, which shows at least 33% reduction in the level of bias than before. And this is just the numbers to show how much the data set was skewed in terms of uh, the ethnicity numbers. And so a data set which contains more African-Americans in, in, in my data set saying they have performed crimes 
uh, probably will be also likely to produce a uh, kind of bias, which would say that they are more likely to commit crimes in future. Now I have balanced them out, and this is like the more balanced data set, which will lead to a better learning and probably uh, de-bias classification as well. So yes, that's all from my side. And again, I'm open to any question answers now. Thank you so much, Dr. Vic, for that. And I'm definitely going to uh, open the floor now um, for questions from the members of the audience. If you have a question, definitely please type in the chat if you don't want to, you know, uh, on your mic uh, so that we can, you know, uh, we can definitely hear from you. So um, spending the time we're waiting for people to actually address the question. So one thing that I, I love the way you presented all the different biases. So one question that I have is that, when it comes to human biases, and I, and I, I, I like the, the, the kind of you know, uh, kind of demonstration that you showed us how you were trying to remove the biases. But one thing that I'm wondering is like, and you talked about it in your presentations that you know what, when the data or the archive are already biased, right? So um, chances of us having them, uh, the algorithm or whatever you're going to produce is definitely going to be biased. So what's the way forward? Is it not a point where we should say that, you know, you have to accept the biases, like that's just a fact of life because we cannot do without them? Yes, I think uh, what, what you have like hammered on the point here is like, we are flawed as human beings. So what we do is flawed. So what we teach the machine is also flawed. But, but when, we, when we get to play like the creator and when we are creating an algorithm, I would like it to be unbiased i think that's just fair for people it's it's going to serve and and again like we wouldn't want to create our algorithms in our own image like how faulty we are so that's that's the motivation which guides me and again like you said it, it's hard because we are collecting the data from and i think microsoft launched uh, and again i'm, I'm bringing my uh, conversational ai background because uh, microsoft launched a system called microsoft pay and it worked perfectly in china but when they launched, uh, and it, in China, it was co probably called Zowies, and then they launched it in US and it called Microsoft Day, and they had to take it down within 24 hours of launching. The reason was they were, it was using social media data to learn, and all the wrong things which we say in social media, all the explicit words, all the racially charged words which we use, it learned pretty fast. And then when it, when it was interacting with people, it was interacting in, in a very racist kind of way and Microsoft had to take it down because uh, there, there was huge complaints about it. And what it shows is the problem when we, when we do not de-bias the data. And uh, when, when uh, Daniel's group was presented, they're using ResNet. And that's because ResNet is a very popular and it has been used uh, extremely, like, extremely popular. And when, when people are developing any image uh, recognition in computer vision, they, they use those data sets. Uh, the problem with if the learning will transition to a separate data set when we are using them, and, and I think they touched on that as well, like because they will need to be de-biased. Otherwise, uh, like one size doesn't fit all in, in, in AI. So if, if we develop those, uh, use those data sets and we will see 40 models. And again, I think there are so many levels of tackling it. We can do the best that we can. We can make the data set more, uh, we can first create unbiased data sets then when we are using our algorithm, we can, uh, we can focus on not just the accuracy, but also, like I said, find the spot where we can say that our algorithm is accurate enough, at which point the organization won't suffer or the performance won't suffer. But now is the time we focus on, on the fairness of it, the transparency of it, the explainability of it. And, and those are the things which we can do as, uh, as developers. As researchers, we can be more careful about those things. I think that's why a massive awareness is useful. And uh, a lot of computer science uh, conferences and journals, they, they have been focusing on that. So I think awareness is the first stage. Uh, so after that, like we can work with the data and we can work with the algorithms. Thank you so much for that because uh, uh, one thing that uh, uh, we, 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 we tend to glamorize AI a lot, right? We, we act as if, you know, when we hear and we, and in all this conversation, we feel this kind of, you know, um, a hum like a, a, a person with their own minds. And sometimes we forget that, you know, these are things that we develop, right? So, and then these are uh, uh, algorithms that are built by people. And then when the people themselves are kind of biased, then it, there's no way they can develop something that is um, 
on bias. So recognizing at least that, and I like the fact that you 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 mentioned that you know at at least that fairness, that transparency is extremely important, so that at least people know from where you come, right? So what's done and what is driving your first um. Your, your like kind of your framework what is driving and, and then the design of that in that way at least people can know because one thing that you mentioned and even daniel also mentioned that you uh can develop that they are trying their best to make sure that it's going to be useful like a small uh uh, uh museum for, for example a small archives right so but again because it is uh very for a specific context it cannot apply so they're going to be definitely need uh to uh adapt it to the different contexts when you, you talk about the, the Microsoft example. I think we have a, a couple of questions here in the chat. If I, uh, let me see here. Okay. So if you can read that Dr. Vig, then that would be good. Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So I'm, I'm looking at Andrew, your first comment, the bias can be mitigated on when and only when non-biased data are absolutely essential for solving the target problem. Which should be for the system owner. There should be strong motivation, otherwise, technical measures won't work. Yes, I, I, I can see this motivation, and if I'm getting you correctly. So, yeah, if, if there's a problem, I think otherwise, when you talk about motivation, uh, are you talking on motivation from the organization perspective or from, from the development perspective? Okay, so organization, yeah, so one worrying trend, and again, it's not worrying, it's, it's how the world works, is, is I have seen even when I'm you know, reviewing conference and journal papers is we focus too much on the profitability of, of the organ from organization perspective, and it's, it's perfectly fine because that's, that's how uh, the business works, and that's why I think it has to be a holistic approach, uh, because if you look, let's take the example of uh, Tesla. Now they have developed self-driving cars, which are using black box algorithms. And if the car gets into any accident, it's, it's a fault of the driver, uh, not the organization. So that, that's their way around it. But if we develop policies, which in turn kind of, definitely it's a fault of the driver, but at least it should put some of the blame on, on the organization who developed it on maybe the, the group subgroup within the organization who ended up developing it. If we make those accountable, if, them, if we make those people accountable as well, and that's the whole accountability principle, uh, which is again, like a different direction of research. Uh, I think that would motivate people to develop models, which, which are not biased because, and, and again, what, what causes the machine or the system to behave in a way it does, we cannot make it black box. So we have to make it more transparent. So if we know what makes it take, what makes it do certain things, then we will have a better idea of how to stop also some of the, some of the mistakes, some of the errors on the, on the system side. But again, the organizations won't have that motivation unless there's, a, there's very strict guidelines, policies, and they, they could be legally charged uh, for, for even like the faults of the AI system. Thank you for that. And I think I have, there's another comment from Andrew where he says like, it seems to be the de de biasing is almost like in introducing new biases because you, you, the sample that you show, right? So you have to add uh, non-minority groups again. So uh, any reaction or comment to that? So again, like although uh, in, in that example, although I added uh, non-minority groups, those were the examples. So the statistically, the distribution of the non-minority groups uh, they so say for example let's just and again this is just a number let's go with say uh, they found that in in the original data set there were only 10 percent asians who had a certain say minus two uh, score on recidivism so now when the with the even newer samples so i increased the number of samples but the distribution didn't change so that's why i think uh, compared to other techniques like smart or uh, oversampling and undersampling uh, this, uh, the synthetic data makes more sense because we are not tweaking the distribution at all. So if the, if Asians were always involved with more, less crime in the data set, even adding new points will make it similar. So we are not adding them uh, in terms of uh, what will, uh, so we are not adding Asians with more crime records. We are just following exactly how the data set is. So there's uh, none of the statistical, parameters are modified. So they all remain the same. 
we are just adding numbers because machine learning models they are terrible when we present them with unbalanced data sets so for example that this is also called the accuracy paradox if i have uh, out of my 100 samples if i have 90 samples which are of the majority class and the remaining 10 which are minority my machine will predict uh, say the majority every time and the reason is it will still get a 90 percent accuracy based on that and uh, it doesn't care if it predicts the minority class wrong just because of the overall accuracy is amplified by that so again that's why i think again the parameters which we use for evaluation that also needs to be changed we will have to evaluate them by subgroups so first what i did here with the debiasing i actually made sure that my machine learns it properly but then again it doesn't stop there I, I'll, again the evaluation metrics will also need to be modified such that all the subgroups are treated uh, with care with separately thank you so much any other comment that we have uh in the chat uh all right. So, okay, Andrew, thank you. He's like, uh, you know what? Important bias, just like beauty is often in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, it is. <laughs> it is. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> exactly right. Like, but something that we consider bias will, may not be, you know what, uh, uh, a bias for you. So, yeah, it's definitely in the eyes of the beholder. But now I, I just wanted to ask you a question, and I think maybe Marina uh, Sumek and then uh, Daniel Swell can jump in. Um, where do you see... Uh, the future, right? When we consider all these biases and, and as we're looking forward to um, uh, emerging technologies and how they apply to uh, uh, archival appraisal and selection, where do you see, uh, what, where, wh what kind of caution will you give uh, to archivists moving forward? And maybe what kind of recommendation will you give them moving forward? So for one, I, I when, when I look at the different archival research which I've been involved with and again working on the AI front, I, I do feel archivists are more aware of these problems than computer scientists. Uh, the, the challenge would definitely be to handle the data and without like collaborations uh, because uh, we are working with some, some data uh, with the University of British Columbia and because it's in Canada, the challenge is to share it with people in the US or in, in other countries. So I think sharing of the data is a challenge which will definitely slow down the process. Uh, but like I mentioned, I have seen that archivists like an archival association, they come with uh, definite mission statements. They are more aware of these issues. So even from day one, when, when I've been working with them, the goal has been to develop something which, which works better for the people in terms of say transparency or in terms of explainability uh, rather than black box model. When I work on similar issues in, with, with my computer science partners, like um, organizations and uh, what I see like computational, uh, conversational AI platforms, what I see the focus is more on increasing the accura accuracy of the model, user acquisition, profitability, like uh, I think it was mentioned. Uh, but archivists, at least they have their heart in the right place and they know what, what, uh, what are the issues which we have to deal with. Uh, the process is slow. And I could tell you that like based on the project time, uh, I could have actually done twice the work if I was in, in working with uh, computer scientists. Uh, but that's also because we do not care about some of those nuanced factors. Oh, and, and again, that's a challenge, educating them that this needs to be taken care of over accuracy. Thank you so much. I don't know if Daniel wanted to uh, chime into that question. Um, um... I think that's kind of a question that addresses uh, both of the presentation this morning, like, you know, because you guys are addressing, I have, um, you know, historical biases in, archi in archives and how now when we apply artificial intelligence, how, what kind of advice, what kind of caution should uh, archivists take or anyone who's working in that field, what kind of caution or advices would they take? And it's really interesting in the, um, when, uh, the presentation, and you made a comment, Dr. Vic, where you talked about, uh, you know what, what you just mentioned right now, saying that, you know what, activists have that uh, ability so they can prepare, so they have kind of statement and uh, roadmap to say, okay, this is what is in there. And so I'm, I'm wondering on the side of the, uh, the, the computer scientists, is there a need? Uh, I know you, you talked about uh, 
uh, transdisciplinary collaboration, interdisciplinary co collaboration. But do you see uh, even a willingness on the side of the uh, computer scientists to say, okay, you know what, we want to see that maybe develop uh, such uh, what's that principles or guidelines that can help us, you know what, mitigate this, uh, you know what, uh, mitigate the biases as we develop our algorithm. I think, yes, the focus is shifting more towards that because now we have this and we see the problems with some of the AI technologies. So uh, the focus has definitely been shifting and even uh, National Science Foundation, they launched, I think a few months back, a separate domain, which is only for ensuring uh, legal and uh, legal and computational accountability in, in AI, uh, AI world. And I ended up collaborating with two of my colleagues. One of them is a lawyer and the other person is a cultural specialist. So I think uh, that kind of shows the direction where, where even uh, like, at least in the United States, NSF is actually taking the first step in that direction saying like, we need transdisciplinary research. So it's, it's not just about uh, building AI, but also making sure they, that the accountability involves the legal process. It also involves the cultural process in it as well. So you develop a more uh, aware system uh, than what you would otherwise do. So there's a push for that. And I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that uh, we, we will see more of that in future. Thank you so much for that. I don't know if anyone has a, another question, but I think uh, uh, it's a great way to uh, go to at the end of our session today, because one thing that I I think archivists uh, fear a lot, right, is you know that you are not they are not trained as uh, computational scientists, right? So when you see AI, almost like, you know, you have to be a computer scientist, but uh, opening their minds and uh, um, showing that they have something to bring to the table is really important. And um, also one of the points that we, uh, we uh, the panelists raised yesterday was like, how do you train now the new archivists? How do you uh, uh, prepare them to be the archivists, right, of, of the 21st century? And this is a question that has been asked, but I don't know if you want to chime in that before we get to uh, the, the close of this session today. So one way would definitely to be include them in, in some of the coursework, because if you look at my background, I'm working at the School of Information, and teaching students in uh, MLIS program. Uh, I, I don't teach with our Master in Archival Records Administration program, but it's there and in future probably I will. And the goal is to, like I said, increasing awareness, increase awareness, increase awareness. So even including that as part of the coursework, uh, I face a challenge when I'm, I'm teaching my students because they often feel like, why, do, why would a librarian need to know about machine learning? So again, that's a process, but at least, uh, what I tell my students is that allows you to get a seat at the table. So you will be aware of what's being discussed there, even if you're not an expert in it, at least you will know what we are talking about. So I think that's also important. And I think more schools, when they include that as part of their, uh, the formal training or like the formal curriculum, I think uh, that would be, that would also be beneficial for all parties. Thank you so much for that. And, and that's one thing that we are trying to do here, the hope for AI research in archives, um, creating that kind of platform where we, uh, that there has been a great demand from the uh, archivists in this first session we had to kind of just create a platform where people are can actually what we call demystify AI for archivists and uh, librarians. And I think that's, that's a great point. And so we want to say thank you to everyone who joined us this morning. Thank you to Dr. Vic, and Dr. Daniel, uh, Smeik and uh, Marinda, Dr. Liz, and thank you so much for just uh, being here today with us. And I hope, uh, I don't know if you have a final word that you want to share with us, uh, Dr. Daniel, your team. Uh, uh, before we close out today. <laughs> I just wanted to thank Suvik for an amazing uh, and mind and I think talk. Amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really amazing. And then uh, thank you so much for that. And I uh, thank our guests, I mean, our guest speaker for your time and then dedication. We're looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow where we're going to have this working session. And I hope members of the audience are going to come in because we want it to be more, uh, it's community driven, right? And then what you heard from all the presentation today is that the stakeholders, you guys are the stakeholders. You don't need to be an expert at computer science, but the 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 uh, the so he's a historian. So the the expertise that you bring, the sensitivity that you bring, is going to be really really important as we uh, think about 
developing a shared understanding, a shared framework, or some kind of guidelines that we're going to share with the world out there for anyone, at least to start a conversation, it may not be the end of it, but at least to start a conversation about when you think about applying AI in archival uh, appraisal and selection. Again, so thank you to everyone, and I want to wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening, afternoon, or morning, right, for those of you who are <laughs> part of the world is too early. Thank so thank you so much and then we we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you.